I was born in 1948. This is, uh, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, what became uh, uh, almost overnight a place, quote, behind the Iron Curtain, unquote. Previously, it wasn't that. And um, uh, because uh, of this occupation by the uh, Soviet army, uh, it was basically, time had ch times had changed. And parents uh, all over the place uh, were beginning to name their babies uh, Ivan and Vladimir and uh, names like that. Imagine that, a Romanian. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my parents who uh, never bent uh, said, no way, we will name this, this guy Adrian. You know, Adrian, the, uh, you know, the emperor of Romania once upon a time was a Roman province. So that's the, uh, the, the reason for my name. And by the way, anyway, my, uh, my name, yes, it's short. Uh, and it has served me well in, uh, for example, scientific publishing, because I don't have to explain uh, much about it. Um, so, uh, yeah. how, how did you come to be uh, interested in thermodynamics? Like, what has your intellectual journey been like uh, over the years? Well, in, uh, I spent my, the first 20 years in uh, Romania, obviously under communism, so... Uh, uh, <laughs> Contrary to my uh, choice, I learned a lot about uh, uh, the opposite of a, a free society. Um, that's basically uh, the main facet of my background. Under communism, uh, there was uh, very little to do. Um, if you chose not to uh, become a uh, party activist, which was of course my choice, so I was uh, seriously into um, um, becoming a basketball player, which I uh, achieved, and um, at the same time uh, becoming a uh, Mathematics Olympia champion, which I achieved. And uh, uh, it turns out that uh, this uh, uh, two-prong attack to uh, making something out of myself uh, uh, bore fruit. Uh, and um, I think I owe everything to that uh, uh, beginning, which was um, uh, a beginning not only with purpose, but with, um, with a uh, huge dose of, um, of wanting to prove something, okay? Um, and uh, in 1968, which was the uh, time of the Prague Spring, uh, and then the summer of the Prague Spring in uh, Czechoslovakia, um, uh, the uh, doors uh, toward freedom in uh, Eastern Europe cracked a little bit. This is before the uh, Soviet uh, suppression of the uh, Czechoslovak uh, uh, movement. And so uh, during that summer, I, uh, I won a mathematics contest, uh, which allowed me to come study um, at MIT. I'm coming to... Uh, the answer to the question of how I chose thermodynamics. Uh, well, uh, this is not original to say thermodynamics chose me. Because, so, so I was an undergraduate at MIT. I was extremely poor. Um, most of the time I was uh, holding four simultaneous uh, student jobs on campus to uh, feed myself. And one of them, which turned out to be um, providential was uh, to help, uh, I was basically a helper, well, sometimes janitor, but the helper in the basement of the cryogenics laboratory. Cryogenics is the place where uh, um, air liquefaction is happening and, you know, nitrogen, helium, uh, once upon a time permanent gases are um, uh, basically uh, compressed and expanded to become really, really cold, uh, low temperature, um, engineering, which really means um, championship level thermodynamics, cryogenics. And the director of the laboratory, uh, Joseph Smith Jr., his name, he just passed away, um, liked me very much because at the same time I was taking his um, undergraduate course in thermodynamics, and he adopted me, and uh, I became, uh, after 
I finished my bachelor's degree. I became a graduate student for my master's and then PhD in that lab. And um, so there's chance, okay? That's the answer, chance. Um, but in uh, looking back, I think uh, I, uh, I was exposed to thermodynamics in a very, very um, uh, special way because if you don't know thermodynamics, you have absolutely zero chance in, uh, in uh, cryogenics. Uh, that almost also means everything at the time, uh, uh, rocketry and uh, moonshots and all these other things were going on in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, uh, liquid fuel, solid fuel, all these things uh, uh, come from, uh, from cryogenics, including, of course, these days, uh, medicine, all these techniques of, uh, of living organ preservation and all of that is cryogenics. So. Uh, so the, uh, the so-called technology, which is actually a science in itself, uh, is, as I just said, the, the, uh, the, the most critical way in which to, uh, to put um, principles of thermodynamics to work. Uh, 20 years ago, with a steam engine, uh, they were <laughs> the same principles were <laughs> put to work for the purpose of, uh, of uh, moving things, you know. Uh, pulling water out of the coal mines and uh, powering locomotives. But uh, today the, um, the, the usefulness of thermodynamics is, uh, is, is extremely broad. It's uh, equivalent to the usefulness of uh, eating food, okay? That's basically the, uh, the, how important the, the, the discipline is. So how would you, uh define thermodynamics. So what is thermodynamics and how has it changed over the centuries? Good point. Thermodynamics uh, answers your question with its own name. Thermodynamics uh, was uh, a name invented by Lord Kelvin uh, to mean uh, uh, therme means uh, heating in Greek and dynamis means power in Greek. So it really means uh, power from fire. Okay, however, the, uh, the man who uh, had the click uh, about the so-called thermodynamics uh, first was uh, Sadi Carnot, whose uh, only book before he died of cholera was uh, The Motive Power of Fire, meaning that yes, uh, from fire, power can be extracted with a contrivance, and that power is <laughs> then used for the purpose of moving things. So uh, thermodynamics uh, to this day, the discipline unfortunately has uh, restricted itself to the uh, so-called conversion of uh, heating into power. Uh, it has uh, turned a blind eye on uh, what happens to the power. And this is uh, so-called uh, blind eye that I'm now opening. Uh, to show that the uh, movement uh, goes uh, hand in glove with the first two, the fire and the power. And that movement, as uh, the history of everything has shown, is uh, evolving uh, in, through uh, contrivance, after con and contrivance after contrivance in that direction that you spelled out of a greater density of uh, this or that, in my case, the density of uh, flow or movement or coverage, or access, or freedom, also, or efficiency, or uh, effectiveness. There are all these words that uh, clever people had uh, coined in all sorts of uh, fields that um, are considered separate on the campus. So thermodynamics initially was just uh, a study of, well, how heat transfers uh, within systems and then over time, or I, I guess you, um, given that heat transfer is a flow, you're like, okay, well, how does, what are the characteristics of these flows and are they consistent um, across contexts or uh, is there some variance? Uh, most of the beginning was about uh, the um, conversion or the transformation of the flow of uh, heat into the uh, flow of stuff, meaning movement. Uh, the movement of a piston, the piston uh, coming out of the steam chamber, steam under pressure. So uh, the steam is under pressure because it's being heated. 
and then uh, boom, because of the contrivance, uh, you have uh, movement. That was mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, the birth, and I would say the uh, the uh, meat and bones of thermodynamics that uh, most students are learning today. Um, and but that uh, icon, the let's call it the cylinder, cylinder and piston. Okay, the cylinder is being heated, the piston is moving things. Um, is uh, yeah, it's an icon because everything that uh, turns and uh, pushes uh, or goes in and out is uh, is this, is that. And uh, every wheel that turns is comes from uh, the movement of uh, that piston or rod. I mean, literally, that's uh, that's how how it happens. That movement uh, sometimes it's uh, rot rotating, as in the uh, in the ax axle of the um, you know turbine rotor, in a in a steam turbine in the modern uh, uh, steam turbine power plant. But um, uh, these are uh, these are details that have to do with the evolutionary design of what goes on. Uh, uh, inside the uh, so-called black box, meaning the uh, the cylinder and piston was replaced these days by uh, by the tiny tiny chambers of uh, steam between uh, the uh, blades and veins of the uh, rotating uh, piece of machinery. It's uh, it's a different drawing, but <laughs> it's the same principle. Um, and you, you've summarized this principle in. Uh what you've coined uh, constructor law. Uh, so the, okay, the constructor law is about uh, uh, what has been overlooked uh, during the first, let's say 150 years of the, uh, of the evolution of uh, thermodynamics. Uh, yes, uh, from fire comes uh, power and from power comes movement, but uh, uh, at the same time, and on top of everything else, the uh, the heating itself is a technology that has evolved, meaning combustion chambers uh, are not what they used to be. The uh, power uh, generation I just mentioned, the evolution from a cylinder and piston to uh, to steam turbines and other things today, uh, that uh, that configuration, that drawing has evolved, that flow architecture has evolved, and most obvious is the fact that the uh, contrivances that um, that uh, affect the movement have been uh, evolving and proliferating and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, coming on top of uh, uh, each other over the decades and centuries. Uh, we still have, uh, you know, carriages and, uh, and uh, trains pulled by locomotives, but of course we have everything else, uh, automobiles and airplanes and uh, and all sorts of contrivances uh, that uh, we plug into the wall. And by the way, the uh, elect electric power in the wall comes from an, an entire generation of uh, transformers of power from, uh, from uh, movement in the power plant to uh, electric power in the uh, transmission lines and back to movement in your uh, um, okay, shaving apparatus in the bathroom, okay? So uh, it, <laughs> eventually it's movement. And that movement, I'm glad I got to this uh, shaving apparatus uh, uh, example. If, if that, <laughs> movement, that movement dissipates the power, destroys the power. You know, once, uh, once used, the power is gone. Uh, once used to move the train on the rail, Yes, what you have at the end of that power is the movement, the displacement from uh, one city to another. But the power itself is gone. So uh, think about it. You burned uh, some fuel to create heating, and then uh, that uh, generated the power that is responsible for the movement of the object, <laughs> movement against its environment. The environment is always resisting movement. That's why it's called the environment. Uh, environment is not equipped with the, uh, uh, let's say, stupidity of getting out of the way because you wanted to get out of the way. It has to be pushed out of the way, the environment. And that uh, interaction between mover and environment destroys the power. And the result of it is the displacement. And um, okay, in this uh, very short uh, um, scenario, 
uh, at the end of having burned the fuel, you have movement. However, over time, meaning from one uh, generation of uh, thinkers to the next, the uh, movement has been enhanced, meaning the travel is longer, let's say longer per unit of uh, fuel burnt. And that uh, is possible, that has been possible, and will continue to be possible through the um, um, unstoppable uh, evolution of contrivances. Contrivances, you know, better everything. Better, the wheel is one example. The uh, rota rotating movement, the, uh, the ball bearings, all these things. Uh, and of course, uh, the same in uh, electrical engineering. I mean, the examples are, I, I think it would be idiotic to try to catalog them. And so the evolution of design is, uh, is part of uh, this discipline. The fact that uh, uh, arch flow architectures are evolving and the fact that the, their evolution is uh, oriented in time in a discernible direction. And that direction is the constructor law. The constructor law uh, briefly is the, uh, yeah, the observation like all laws of physics, they are uh, rooted in, uh, in uh, observations of, uh, of happenings that uh, occur in the billions, happenings that are of the same type. type. That observation is that um, a finite size uh, system, in order to persist in time, which means to live, it must evolve so that it provides easier access to what flows. So the, that's it, that's the constructor law. It uh, proclaims the tendency of any flow architecture that has freedom to morph, to morph in the direction of, uh, okay, <laughs> uh, liberating its uh, currents uh, bit by bit, but in a direction, yes, of a greater freedom or greater access or as I said earlier, uh, in other languages, greater efficiency, greater uh, let's call it more uh, greater economy or uh, or better smarts, whatever you want to uh, to 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 do to improve my uh, my delivery. And what flows? I mean, it seems that everything flows, right? Uh, from rivers to, as you mentioned, um, goods in an economy, uh, blood. All of these are shaped by well, the the flow channels are shaped by what you've described as constructor law. So how, what, um, what does this shape uh, look like? Um, how, how do these flows manifest? And um, what's, what's driving this architecture? Well, is the tendency. You, uh, you spoke the word channels. Uh, channels, uh, by the way, I also uh, like to draw. Uh, the channels are the black on, uh, on the white. The white is the, the background. Uh, and the channels are the uh, the contrast, uh, the uh, the birth of uh, that contrast. That is the flow architecture, the drawing. Uh, the name for that is design, except it means drawing uh, at its origin. That drawing is uh, a uh, graphic expression of uh, of the uh, natural tendency that the uh, constructor law captures. The, the channel with the uh, 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 wet uh, banks around it is the flow architecture that uh, is uh, uh, at that moment the best for uh, for vehicle, for uh, carrying the water from the plain to the sea. Uh, but uh, wait until tomorrow. The uh, drawing will be even better. And then 10 years later will be even better. Uh, that's the, uh, that's the constructor law uh, as a movie, it's on display, if you're curious, uh, to ask uh, what happens to the uh, drawing of the river basin on the world map, uh, say, next year, meaning to, to be uh, aware of the fact that uh, these drawings you see in the geography are not uh, rigid. Everything you see uh, on the world map is in fact morphing, contrary to the impression given by the image. Um, the, these days, with uh, what we see on television all the time, I think people are getting the uh, the idea much uh, faster. The idea that uh, everything in the world is flowing, 
everything in the world is morphing, which means evolving, and is evolving in this direction uh, that the constructor law uh, captures. If you don't know uh, river basins, then you can look at the flow of the air currents on the, on the globe when you look at the weather report uh, every evening. Uh, if you're even more curious and you watch uh, nature shows on television, you'll see similar, uh, yes, uh, better and better reports about oceanic currents, or uh, for that matter, about the migration of animals uh, in the bush or uh, whatever in Africa, or uh, the migration of uh, populations of uh, fish and uh, whales and all sorts of things, birds. Um, it's all the same thing. Everything, uh, the world is in fact a, uh, not a, uh, a random, random distribution of, uh, of uh, arteries and veins of a movement. It's a, uh, a, uh, a web, if you want, or a superposition of, uh, of, I call them flow architectures that are constantly morphing to, uh, to flow more easily, just like the uh, vasculature of the human body. The vasculature of the human body is amazingly efficient. And uh, not surprisingly, it looks just like the uh, architecture of the river basin or of the river delta or, or the architecture of uh, the back of uh, my retina, okay? It's all uh, all the same. If you really go in this direction, you uh, you start sounding like a donkey. You say "aha, aha" all the time because the architecture of uh, the university uh, is the same hierarchy, except that the drawing has not been made. But uh, when people have uh, okay, when they receive orders, uh, that is a flow uh, with the same drawing that uh, the same as the one I've been. Uh, uh, sketching for you, or if they will be free enough to complain, the flow will be in the opposite direction, but it, it would follow the same uh, channels. <clears throat> it's the same in the army, okay? The same in whatever, uh, in the supply chains, you name it. Everything is uh, happening, uh, air traffic on the globe, happening, and it's happening by itself, uh, it is not happening this same way all the time, meaning in this direction, because no architecture is uh, is rigid, uh, not even for a day, uh, but it's happening, it's just happening in this uh, uh, boring, boring one drawing all the time, because yes, the tendency is, uh, is just one. The tendency is for what flows to uh, morph itself, obviously, thanks to freedom, in this direction that uh, leads to images that uh, are discernible. You call them channel. Channel, by the way, channel with respect to what? With respect to, to a, a drawing, it's like uh, the hand and the glove, you see. It's not just the hand, but hand and the glove, or uh, the black one, white, or the male and female. All these things, uh, Sam, uh, come in, in pairs because uh, Again, one of the things that I teach is that uh, a long time ago, uh, flows uh, have uh, shown that it is uh, easier to flow in two ways at the same time, not in one way. In other words, on the, on the wet plain under the rain, uh, the one way would be seepage, seepage, wetness to uh, diffuse uh, from uh, the hills to the sea, just diffuse, okay, from uh, wet to dry in a way that you cannot see it. That's called diffusion. Uh, but to flow two ways is to, to flow through diffusion in those wet banks and then channels uh, at the same time. The channels are the hand, the, uh, the, uh, the muddy uh, uh, banks of the river are the glove. And this, uh, this uh, let's call it, um, um, well, it's called a symbiosis, I guess, if uh, flow means life, um, is everywhere. If you've, uh, you may have heard uh, the, uh, the uh, lie that uh, turbulence is a uh, still unsolved problem. No, it's not unsolved. Turbulence is, uh, uh, is the same phenomenon. The uh, turbulence, you see this uh, billow, billow of uh, smoke out of a smokestack. That is, that is the black, and you can make a drawing of it. 
And this wheel, this wheel, this blob, this blob is called eddy or whirl. This eddy of a, of a rotating uh, uh, fluid is, uh, well, rotating by rubbing inside a housing of air, uh, which is the uh, the surroundings. So the rubbing on the against the surroundings is the diffusion. We don't see the surroundings uh, with their uh, let's call it uh, uh, unhappy situation of being uh, rubbed against. But you see the the rotating eddy. The rotating eddy is the organized motion previously called channel flow, except that in this example the channel is a uh, rotating blob. Mm -hmm. uh, which of course rises because it's buoyant, but that's a more it's a an added complication. But turbulence itself is the same hand and glove of uh, of uh, organized motion, which you can sketch on a background that's uh, basically a white paper, because it's called the viscous diffusion. That's the name for it in uh, in uh, physics. So uh, everywhere it's is the same thing. Uh, it, everything that moves, it moves the same way. You, if you want to uh, test my um, imagination, you can propose to me examples I have not thought of, and I will uh, give you the same answer. Yeah, I, I, I won't even try. I, I believe it. I, I know it. Um, so how do these channels vary in size? Uh, oh, and good point. So uh, now we arrive at uh, another um, uh, aspect of uh, uh, the freedom to morph. Uh, the drawing that, uh, that the flow architecture impresses us with is uh, hierarchical. The, uh, the channels are not uh, one size fits all. The, um, well, uh, the drawing of the channels looks like a tree meaning that the channels are a few large and many small. In most uh, such drawings, the, uh, the, uh, the few large, the, uh, well, the, the, the largest is one. That's the big river that, uh, that enters the uh, delta or dumps uh, the water directly into the ocean. And about the upstream, there is a, um, an arborescent uh, uh, structure of uh, that uh, of course comes from uh, the hills. Uh, we're in the hills. The uh, rivers and the rivulets are uh, are more and more numerous and smaller and smaller as you go uh, uh, uphill. Meaning you're not going uphill. You're just looking uphill. The water comes from uphill and goes downhill. Uh, but your imagination uh, in the free mind uh, you can go in any direction uh, you wish. Um, so it's called architecture, it's called hierarchy, hierarchy. And um, the word uh, comes from uh, obviously uh, uh, old Greek, it means, uh, you know, chief priest, because in the, uh, in the church the, uh, is the same thing that's happened uh, um, by necessity uh, over the uh, many, many centuries in any religion, in any uh, school uh, behind the church is the same thing. Uh, obviously in the university, the army, the, uh, the design of the library, the design of, uh, of, the, of science itself is hierarchical. You have uh, many phenomena and uh, very few uh, principles and even fewer laws. Uh, it's always this way. Uh, you may ask uh, why you know so much. Uh, well, you know so much because what you know is organized hierarchically in your brain. You don't remember all the details. You remember uh, basically uh, very few important things. And then uh, a larger number of uh, uh, important things that are not as important as the first, but they are related or connected to the first. Uh, language itself is that way. Uh, that's why in the language there is a main vocabulary. And, uh, and then a huge one that's used only uh, uh, rarely. But even in the main vocabulary, we have, you have, uh, uh, in any language you, you investigate, uh, the same uh, organization of, uh, of um, uh, fewer and fewer uh, words that are used more and more frequently. 
Yep. So in, in summary, basically everything that flows is organized. Uh, there are a few um, very, very large channels, but they, they are only um, a few. And then there's numerous smaller channels. And this is true for, um, you know, uh, rivers and the tributaries. This is true for words, as you mentioned, we only use a, a certain, uh, you know, a few words, but they dominate language and then uh, the a more infrequent usage of words, uh, well, yeah, they're more infrequent. Um, and this is, you know, uh, in a vasculature, um, even in, um, well, what, what you're saying is that all of this is organized hierarchically and that these hierarchies are baked within, well, hierarchies or you could say inequality is baked within the laws of uh, physics themselves. Um, well, hierarchy uh, is an expression, a visual uh, manifestation of what happens naturally. What happens naturally is the, uh, the name for that is physics, okay? Physics is uh, the name for uh, natural things, natural things. So uh, the natural thing is the tendency of anything to morph the flow more easily. It's not only this hierarchy, which is uh, when a sketch that looks like a tree. Uh, well, if you look more closely, for example, in the, in the tree of the, uh, of the arterial system, uh, in any, uh, say, um, uh, hot-blooded animal, the, uh, the cross-section of uh, every blood vessel is uh, round. Uh, or for that matter, uh, if you look at the bronchial tree, the uh, cross-section of every tube is round. And uh, the circle is a drawing, a drawing, not to be confused with the drawing of a tree. But that drawing, simple as it is, uh, has evolved obviously over a long, long, uh, you know, period of time to be uh, a certain way. And so, so remember the expression, a, a picture is worth a thousand words, meaning I'm not even starting to, to describe it. You just look at it and it speaks of universal tendency. Well, the name for that universal tendency is law of physics. Um, things happen a certain way because that's the way nature is. Mm -hmm. And uh, nature is, uh, luckily for those who study physics, uh, really surprisingly simple because the laws of physics are very few. Uh, in thermodynamics, for example, uh, we have uh, in the classical thermodynamics uh, just two. And the first law and the second law. And now, uh, uh, according to my view of the, the domain, the constructor law, which is the law of physics of evolution. Uh, and that's a good thing that there are so few because uh, you can uh, do great things uh, if uh, you know uh, uh, a few things that you can rely on. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about the laws of thermodynamics soon, but I, I, I just want to spend some more time here on, on constructor law. Uh, you talk about um, how these, how, how th the way things flow, they go from point to area to point. So, you know, these tree shapes. Um, mm -hmm. And you, this is, you said that this is basically, uh, or the, the reason why this happens is because it optimizes for flow. Um, and the reason why this is the case is that through um, small channels or, or through large channels, you can uh, move more effectively, uh, more, more effectively and efficiently. And the reason why there are these areas is because it enables uh, more greater access and that these point to area flows are, are seen everywhere as we've kind of just, you know, explained, um, uh, you know, a, a few times. Uh, so could, could you just kind of touch more on these point to area flows and, um, sure, sure. Correct. Okay. I'll begin with uh, the end of what you spoke, which is correct. Um, if you um, if you compare the um, let's call it fluid friction, the or the pumping power that's uh, required in order to to force water to flow uh, through two two pipes of the same size in parallel, uh, that power is uh, considerably greater than the power required to force the same flow rate of water through one pipe with a volume equal to the sum of the first two volumes. 
So um, what I just uh, concluded is called economies of scale. It's easier to move stuff uh, through one big mover, in this case, a bigger pipe, than uh, uh, through uh, two uh, smaller individual movers. Economies of scale. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, write many homework problems of this kind. Uh, my second very fa uh, uh, favorite problem is, because uh, I grew up on the Danube, you see, uh, you have uh, two small barges. Uh, they are pulled by uh, by uh, one or two tugboats. Uh, the power required to pull two barges uh, full of coal is uh, is uh, a lot bigger than the power to pull a single barge, a bigger one uh, that has uh, the load of the first two. Okay, so that's economies of scale. Now, uh, and by the way, that means that uh, if you, if you uh, believe uh, the constructor law, that means that evolution on the, on the globe or in, in everywhere should be from two to one, meaning from a, a small uh, in parallel to a single one. And then comes the question of uh, why hasn't everything evolved into being big? Look at animals. There's a hierarchy of animals. Uh, say flyers from the house flight to uh, to the condor or the uh, whatever i mean these are it's um, unbelievable i mean uh, why why this uh, the so called uh, diversity by the way it's not diversity it's hierarchy because the big birds are few and the very small insects are very many um, why and uh, the answer is because of what you're beginning to to sketch which is that uh, the uh, the drawing of a movement uh, in nature is not between two points, like uh, these uh, barges on uh, the rectilinear river. Uh, no, the movement is between one point and an infinity of points. Uh, the latter is called area, uh, in the case of uh, water in the river basin, or volume, in the case of air entering my thorax. So uh, if the, uh, the space, uh, area or volume were to be, uh, uh, wetted by uh, big uh, pipes and only big pipes uh, it means that uh, between those big pipes there would be uh, uh, let's call them semi volumes or uh, area armpits that are not wetted uh, meaning uh, areas that are inviting to be uh, wetted by what by smaller smaller tubes and uh, that, uh, so those are now the branches or the tributaries. But even before, the, between those uh, smaller tubes, there's a new generation of even smaller armpits that uh, in order to be, of course, wetted or accessed, they are inviting uh, even smaller tubules. And uh, that's, in other words, uh, the, the first uh, homework problem was correct. Yes, you must use tubes. Uh, one tube, not two in parallel. But okay, now that you have a smaller space, a smaller and smaller area, that means that you, uh, the law of physics tells you that that smaller and smaller space should be uh, traveled by a smaller and smaller single tube. So uh, altogether, you end up with a hierarchy of uh, tubes in which the smaller are many and the larger are few. They come from economies of scale, which is, uh, easy to demonstrate with the very elementary physics on the back of an envelope. Um, my own work is in fact uh, of this kind. I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to explain uh, where all these drawings of nature, called design in nature, come from by using uh, examples and words that are uh, familiar to everybody. Everybody. You know, uh, if you don't know anatom anatomy, uh, that's not a problem. You probably know uh, livers. You probably have seen, uh, obviously, birds and uh, insects. And, uh, or you probably paid attention to what your cat is doing. Uh, and well, uh, then uh, I, you can talk to me about that because I paid attention to these things all the time. <clears throat> and an example that's probably close to home for everyone is, um, going to work you know you have to to get to if you want to if you live outside of town and you go into the city for work 
you jump on the train, which is a massive channel. Everyone jumps on the train that goes to the, you know, the central part of the city, which is the area, and then everyone diffuses across the landscape to go to their work. Um, Correct. Yeah, it's true. It's true. If you would put a, a, a red the light bulb on the uh, top of everybody's head, and then make a movie from above, you'll see the flow of uh, those red, uh, okay, like red blood cells in the uh, in the body of this uh, uh, animal called the city. Okay, but in what you uh, spelled out, it's the uh, the uh, invasion of the uh, city territory by the flow that originates from the train station. But uh, it, that's in the morning. At the, in the evening, the flow is in the other direction, but it's uh, organized along the same channels called streets or uh, street cars or whatever, or vehicles. Um, or somebody, I mean, with uh, GPS, whatever, or drones, they sh might make movies of this type uh, very soon to show that uh, we're actually not uh, uh, going through the city by uh, bumping into uh, uh, walls or, uh, or uh, houses, you know. We're actually uh, channeled by these uh, alleged grids in a tree-like fashion. Yeah. Um, it's this, uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful, uh, this law, and, you know, I, I've, I'm very interested in economics and it's uh, how it relates to issues of well, ethics and justice and all of that. And something that's always been a very popular topic is this idea of social inequality and that, you know, we have some companies or some people that earn a tremendous amount of money compared to uh, the rest of the population. Um, and as, you know, the Pareto distribution says, um, this is completely natural. And what this, what you're describing is the physical underpinning, like the physics under, that underpins uh, this um, uh, phenomenon. So what in reality, inequality or hierarchy is baked into um, the laws of the natural world and it should be um, uh, expected. Um, but what's very interesting in your book, um, Freedom and Evolution, is that not only should it be expected, but a degree of inequality actually is good for the whole uh, because it optimizes um, the, it optimizes the flow of things. Um, so, Correct. could you talk? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The uh, um, the good uh, of uh, the whole in society is called wealth. Wealth, a society that flows uh, better, which means uh, flows more per unit of uh, fuel or um, food used is a, a wealthier society and wealth is a, a term in economics but uh, it turns out that the wealth uh, as i show in that book is uh, uh, this is now empirically the facts the fact is that the, the wealth of a group say a country is uh, roughly roughly uh, in a one-to-one -one relationship with the um, uh, meaning the GDP, which is an annual measure of the wealth, is uh, proportional to the annual consumption of the fuel by that group. Uh, and that means uh, the annual, annual movement that that fuel, uh, through its power, drives uh, on the territory of the group. Um, now, the movement, as we had uh, clarified in this discussion of what comes out of the train station in the morning, uh, is along uh, channels uh, that happened over the evolution of, uh, of uh, civilization, which means uh, city living, city living, and um, meaning it was not dictated by a dictator. The uh, architecture of the city was, uh, it's morphing all the time to become better and better, okay? Um, and um, so that the movement is hierarchical. And that means that uh, what is proportional to the movement, which is called wealth, is hierarchical. This is the physics. The physics is uh, the constructor law that I, uh, I, uh, I illustrated with the movement of uh, things through channels. Now, the punchline is that the, uh, the wealth hierarchy, or the wealth inequality, is physics. And um, if you, people who know uh, the history of anything, uh, especially the history of uh, uh, 
groups or uh, uh, countries or civilization that tried uh, uh, to uh, go against nature, uh, those attempts have always been, uh, uh, how should I say, defeated. Defeated. Uh, if you, if one uh, tries to fight nature, why not one loses? That's uh, a lesson from uh, uh, studying history. And uh, that is particularly clear about uh, wealth um, hierarchy. Um, uh, there have been many revolutions, uh, or uh, let's call them uh, convulsions, that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, were driven by uh, the desire of groups to uh, eliminate inequality. Uh, and uh, overnight, uh, after the the uh, uh, eliminating of the inequality, a new hierarchy was born overnight. You look at, uh, say, the Bolshevik Revolution, that's the best uh, example of this kind, the most, uh, I would say, infamous. Um, and um, that's nature, okay, because uh, without it, meaning you, you cannot fight it, it just happens uh, overnight. We have uh, these, uh, for example, in the US now, uh, uh, entire sections of a city occupied uh, by people who are uh, revolting against uh, what you're bringing up. And uh, two days later, they have a, uh, a hierarchy. There's a leader, there's a spokesman, there's a, uh, I don't know what, what they have their own, uh, uh, let's call it police, their own police. Uh, uh, overnight. Why? Because this is the way to uh, to live more easily. Otherwise, no, the other ways doesn't exist. The so-called anarchy, I have not seen it, okay? Uh, it just doesn't happen. Anarchy would be the equivalent of the diffusion without channels in uh, my previous description of physical systems. So um, that's... Uh, that's the physics of uh, inequality. But in the same book, I'm uh, happy you bring it up. I um, I question the uh, not only uh, the physics, which I answered, but uh, what to do about it. Well, two things. One is uh, not to be the fool who tries to defeat the nature. But yes, it is also uh, good for the society to uh, well, especially for those. Uh, in the positions of power to know uh, what uh, not to do versus what can be done. And for example, uh, what can be done is what, uh, what uh, advanced civilizations have been doing uh, since I think uh, uh, forever, if you look at the history of uh, where we come from, uh, with, uh, with acts of, um, of uplifting the uh, the, those who are forgotten were lost in the pockets, in the smaller and smaller pockets. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, tiny roads uh, to the uh, single house in the middle of the forest, uh, where the, uh, the uh, one uh, room uh, school at the back of the church, again, in the tiny clearing in the forest, meaning education in this example. Um, and then, of course, uh, after uh, literacy and uh, comes uh, uh, healthcare, say uh, medicine and hospitals and uh, all sorts of things. Th th these are the um, the uh, the uh, layers of organization that come on top of existing layers. Um, more such layers uh, in a more advanced society. If you really dig deeper into what's uh, in uh, in an advanced society, you'll see uh, as I what I described. Uh, not only the the architecture of what uh, uh, cannot be avoided, which is the movement, physical movement of bodies uh, on a territory, and uh, of course vehicles and trucks and uh, freight, but also the movement of um, of uh, for example um, medicine or education or information that has the effect of bringing the, uh, the community together. Uh, I call it uplifting. And in the book, I have uh, I show through examples that in, uh, in uh, countries where uh, the advancement is uh, 
more and more evident that the level of um, or the severity of the inequality is uh, relatively speaking uh, uh, mitigated or decreased. Yeah, uh, I also yeah. show I also show with a uh, with a very uh, let's call it extreme example that where uh, the uh, what's good for the society as a whole is absent, such as in the uh, uh, hierarchy of uh, the flow in the river basin, the uh, fl the flow inequality is much steeper than in a uh, in a human society, much steeper. So uh, <laughs> even the uh, less advanced uh, countries are uh, a lot more equal than the water flowing uh, in uh, a river basin because of the uh, the fact that society by definition is uh, is about the uh, the flow of the whole not the flow of the individual society or social organization happens um, out of the uh, uh, okay, selfish interests of the individual. People come together, again, economies of scale, come together in many, many uh, four configurations because it's a lot uh, easier uh, for the individual to, uh, to uh, do things, uh, okay? Uh, not alone, not alone, mm -hmm. not one against the world. Yeah. Just, uh, I'd like to keep, going on this discussion um in in your book freedom and, and evolution um you show what happens what would happen if uh, there was complete equality um and how <laughs> after a very short period of time uh, inequality just manifests sure that's right uh, I, actually i showed two things with that uh, example um uh, because yes, uh, with pencil and paper, you can make a drawing. Uh, equality would be a territory that's uh, covered by a grid, a grid of uh, channels of uh, the same uh, length and the same thickness, channels uh, with the uh, with the same flow rate through them, and uh, and yes, you can calculate uh, easily the. Uh, how much power it is required uh, to push the flow again power from fire uh, power is required to push the flow through through that uh, uh, flow architecture however um, the um, the um, if, if the uh, if the if the source of uh, source of this uh, flow that sweeps the whole area is one point uh, in that grid, one point, then necessarily, even through this uh, egalitarian flow architecture, the, the flow rates through the uh, one size channels that are close to the source will be huge compared with the flow rates uh, in the peripheral channels of the same size. In other words, if you have a, a society that's all of us, that originally is designed to be uh, egalitarian, uh, one size fits all, well, uh, the people who happen to be uh, uh, close to the only uh, farmer who is uh, raising pigs, uh, well, uh, th th those uh, individuals will be eating a lot more meat than, <laughs> than the ones, their equals, uh, who are situated far from the farm. And um, so um, uh, what I just uh, uh, sketched is a poor man's drawing of what happened uh, at the end of uh, the USSR, egalitarian. And then all of a sudden, uh, some uh, of these uh, equals found the same, uh, uh, found themselves to be next door to uh, to the uh, uh, oil refinery or to the coal mine or some other source of uh, great wealth. Geographically close, just geographically, and they took it. Okay, and, and we all uh, know what happened there. <laughs> yeah, never mind the hierarchy. This is called oligarchy. Uh, it, it happened overnight. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, well, anyway, I'm happy with the uh, with examples that um, 
uh, even though they're extreme and uh, not uh, my uh, my kind, uh, they show that uh, one cannot defeat nature. Okay. Yeah. Um, what role does innovation play in optimizing flow channels, and how does that affect the greater whole? Not just so if there's one channel where there's an innovation, it doesn't just affect that specific channel, but it actually affects the entire the entire flow of the system. Is is that right, correct? Well, that, that, that's very good. Uh, very good. Very good. Uh, you read the, the book correctly. I'm very impressed. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> in, uh, well, in the same uh, very simple sketch, if you imagine uh, this uh, grid of uh, one size fits all, a grid that's spread over the flowing territory, if one individual uh, has the bright idea to uh, make uh, his or her channel uh, wider, wider, that, that click, that uh, flipping of the switch, is the innovation then the flow rate uh, through that particular channel will be greater uh, we've established earlier that uh, greater flow means greater wealth but the increase in flow rate in that local channel uh, goes hand in hand with the greater flow rates in all the in all the channels in the grid uh, more so in the channels that are close or neighboring the uh, channel of the inventor. So the, uh, the effect of one innovation in a society is, uh, has uh, uh, an effect that uh, is one that spreads over the entire territory, but it spreads hierarchically. The, uh, the most benefit goes to the inventor. And then, uh, 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 and less and less uh, to people who are more distant, but the whole society benefits. And those, of course, who uh, happen to be close to the uh, invention are uh, uh, advantaged geographically to benefit more. Uh, you can use this uh, homework problem as a metaphor for everything, else, for everything you know about the evolution and spreading of technology. Um, and it's confirmed by observations, right? We just, like in the Industrial Revolution, um, you know, in the 1800s, um, the, uh, a lot of the innovations happened in the UK and they got the, the windfall. But over time, those, um, those designs for, you know, the more effect, for doing things more effectively um, diffused across the world. And now in our, interne in our interconnected uh, global society, um, innovations, uh, they um, diffuse at a far, far more rapid rate um, yeah. across Use the word travel. Use the word travel, not diffuse, because diffuse is something you cannot draw. Diffuse okay. is, uh, is something that you might feel like uh, uh, heating. That's mm -hmm. diffusion. Uh, but yes, that's the whole point. Uh, the thing with the uh, things coming out of Britain 200 years ago is very apt. Uh, that's a very good uh, example. In fact, is the mother example of uh, what uh, we are enjoying as a standard of living today. But that led to, and by the way, it spread uh, as a uh, arborescent uh, architecture of railroads, first of all. And then came on top of it, a, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the uh, necessary add-on, which was the, the, uh, the uh, arborescent structure of uh, electrification of the globe electrification uh, today of course on top of that is uh, you know the world uh, air traffic or the world uh, uh, communication all these uh, uh, cables uh, on the floor of the oceans uh, uh, is uh, are the the, the latest uh, add-on to uh, what is uh, flowing because it's driven by uh, power from fire uh, I think the Brits are not getting uh, enough credit for uh, for uh, uh, the horse that they let out of their barn, okay? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, through this lens, um, how would you define what technology is? Oh, technology is... Um, ah, uh, I think we can kind of intuitively understand it, but like a, you know, 
a definition. It, it seems to be like an artifact that improves yes. the uh, flow. It improves flow rates or improves, it improves the way different things flow through certain channels. Yes. Technology is, uh, is, is really uh, synonymous with uh, uh, mechanics. Uh, mechanics. Uh, both are Greek words. Uh, mechanics, uh, they mean the same thing. Mihani, uh, Mihani in Greek, uh, and techne uh, in Greek. Uh, both mean um, uh, art or a uh, artifact or a contrivance. A contrivance that is something that's uh, made by uh, individuals. Contrivance to enhance the effect of. Uh, uh, the effort of a naked man. So without the uh, contrivance, naked man would uh, basically not exist. Uh, in fact, naked man uh, stopped existing uh, more than a million years ago, okay? Uh, Thank goodness for that. <laughs> the, uh, because fire, fire was the first big uh, contrivance that, uh, that empowered the, the individual. Uh, and then after that came uh, clothing and boating and, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, domesticated animals. Um, uh, these are, uh, we take them for granted today, but these are huge uh, add-ons that, uh, like everything else in evolution, what works is kept. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, technology. So technology is also, the word techne also, um, um, is the origin of uh, things like tissue or textile, which is, comes from clothing, okay? Clothing, um, um, mihani uh, is everything from uh, um, um, mechanics, mechanisms to a machine today, or uh, machination in uh, behind the doors, uh, social behavior. Uh, you uh, use your imagination. Mm -hmm. We are here. And you are uh, smiling so uh, happily because of technology or because of, uh, of uh, uh, human contrivances uh, uh, everywhere uh, outside of you. And the older you get, the uh, more of them inside of you. Okay? <laughs> exactly. That's, uh, and uh, the, the food that you're eating is also a contrivance because it's the result of... Uh, of um, human ingenuity. It's now, it, it stopped a long time from uh, uh, being uh, uh, the low-lying fruit in some uh, uh, warm uh, weather country. Uh, so I'm glad we we've sorted out technology there. What about freedom? So freedom is this, is this concept that we all have a, an intuitive notion of. Uh, it's not something that we can really, it, it's not something that we can quantify in a way, but you know, the freedom to act within the world is that we, is something that we, at least in the West, put to be as one of our foundational, our, our foundational principles. So what, what is freedom um, from, in, from this, uh, this physics perspective? Uh, freedom, okay, uh, freedom as physics is um, <clears throat> one word for uh, uh, physical features that an entity possesses in order to be able to change, to change. In other words, evolution means uh, change after change after change in a uh, direction that's discernible to the observer. The observer is the thinker who, uh, uh, after enough uh, uh, good observations, becomes a scientist, okay? That's, uh, so that's science. So change after change after change in a, with direction in time is evolution. Um, for evolution to happen, the entity must have the ability to change, uh, which means uh, the opposite of being uh, constrained or straight jacketed. Um, and, um, and yes, uh, freedom defined this way in physics is measurable. This is the key idea of uh, my book, it's measurable. Uh, the measure uh, is known as the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, in the uh, uh, primordial example of the uh, 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 steam cylinder with a piston, uh, that contrivance, uh, <coughs> which was invented by a Frenchman actually uh, uh, more than a century before the steam engine, uh, 
that contrivance has one degree of freedom, which is the uh, the the ability of the piston to travel uh, in rectilinear fa fashion in and out of the of the cylinder. That's one degree of freedom. Uh, well, uh, that's the way uh, the uh, course of uh, physics about freedom begins. It begins with the simplest. But um, a, um, I'll speak to you as an artist now. If you, uh, if you, uh, if you make a drawing uh, with a pencil on a uh, on a blank piece of paper, uh, you have uh, uh, two degrees of freedom. You can move the pencil in the two directions. So you make a two-dimensional drawing. Uh, if you make a sculpture, you have uh, three degrees of freedom because you can uh, move your uh, chisel or whatever in uh, in uh, three dimensions, um, right? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, um, or uh, let's go back to uh, the simple drawing, the two-dimensional one. If you uh, have a more than one sheet of paper, you make one a drawing on one a sheet and then a slightly different one on the next sheet of paper and a slightly different one on the third, and then you run them fast in front of uh, uh, you, you see a movie. So that movie now has uh, three degrees of freedom. One is, uh, so the first two are on the page and the third one is the direction of the time. Uh, so you see freedom is measurable. And, but when it comes to uh, society, of course, the individual, who is uh, walking uh, down the street has uh, a, 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 a impossible to a huge number of degrees of freedom. That individual could, uh, of course, uh, step uh, right or left or uh, forward or backward. They can also be drunk and fall on the ground. That individual <coughs> may want to jump and do all sorts of things. Um, it, uh, different, the different domains, so like the ability to be a teacher or. You know, the oh, professions, yeah, then, do they count as degrees of freedom? Sure, sure. But then you, of course, you are, of course, uh, going in the direction of uh, complicating my example. Yes, because the, the number of uh, degrees of freedom is immense. Um, th that the immense number, uh, here's uh, something I just thought about, that now that I'm answering your question. If you bring these individuals with uh, innumerable uh, degrees of freedom in the... Uh, a relatively small chamber where they meet with the city council, the city council uh, that has to make some decisions about uh, where to install the next uh, beltway around the city, okay? <clears throat> the beltway itself is a drawing with two degrees of freedom because it's a drawing on a piece of, uh, on a blank piece of paper. And so out of the uh, many individuals in the room, some of them are the legislators, uh, out of that uh, immense number of degrees of freedom through the uh, urges of everybody in the room to live more economically uh, in a city emerges a drawing that uh, to somebody from Mars has only two degrees of freedom, you see? Uh, and that's that's the that's how I go back to uh, your first question about the river channels happening in this uh, surprising uh, uh, same way same way all the time on every uh, uh, rain plain. Uh, well, uh, the water between the uh, grains of the muddy soil uh, has uh, at the level of the grain uh, an infinite number of freedom free, number of freedom, but. Uh, in uh, altogether, the entire territory is like the uh, population, small population, in the uh, chamber of the city council. That uh, a population that unwittingly, unwittingly, uh, walks out of the meeting uh, with consensus. This is mm -hmm. the model of uh, the rule of law. I just, well, I just thought of it, but it's the way it it uh, happens all the time. Yeah, what um, I've been thinking about this idea for, I'd say, a number of years. And one of the reasons why I'm excited to discover your work gives it, you know, a basis in physics. And it's the general liberal idea that what we want to be doing uh, for a number of reasons is increasing the degrees of freedom made available to individuals. And we want to do this for a number of reasons. One is that 
all people are different. Um, a way of life that would suit you may not suit me. And if we, if the flourishing of the individual is something that we want in society, um, the first, one of the first things we should do is try to increase the degrees of freedom made available to people so that they can choose a path um, that suits them the best. And uh, another reason why this is really beneficial, uh, I think, is because people who act in ways that is really consistent with, um, well, what they want, what, what they think will uh, really fulfill them, generally results in what I would say is uh, benefits to, uh, to greater society. So if you're an artist, you may create art which helps uh, people. If you're an inventor or a, a businessman or uh, you know, an academic, you, you, you contribute back to society. So by increasing degrees of freedom uh, to the individual, um, it ends up resulting in innovations which increase the uh, well, uh, society's um, well-being uh, in general. So it's this, well, it's this wonderful interplay. Yes, yeah, but the first part, which is what uh, freedom does to the individual, um, it's really more degrees of freedom means greater access, greater access in all directions, uh, in all directions, not only uh, the obvious, which is uh, mm. education or food, but uh, um, literacy, access, uh, access literacy, to the internet. But also access to uh, uh, everything from uh, mate to entertainment and to uh, to watching uh, impressive uh, sports. I mean, the, there is access is, a, by the way, I thought a lot before I came up with this word access in the constructive law, because I didn't want to talk about uh, flow resistance or uh, efficiency or some other, um, or uh, survival like in biology, where, you know, words that are uh, uh, territorial or they, uh, they address a small crowd. Uh, here, the um, um, subject of evolution is uh, is about nature that concerns every single entity that uh, moves, and that could be uh, uh, geological or uh, biological or um, <coughs> societal. Uh, anything that moves moves more easily or for greater access if it has, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> greater freedom and uh, the ability to obviously morph in order to evolve because uh, without, uh, frankly, without change, there's uh, nothing, nothing to look at. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing to look at, meaning uh, if evolution had, had not been happening, then the uh, nature around us would be, uh, would be not uh, not uh, worth uh, observing or painting or or singing about. Mm. So um, I think we've got around you know, uh, maybe thirty minutes to go or so. I, I'd I'd like to move to a discussion of where we are today as a, a global society and the challenges we face and how all of them are in a way dependent upon energy. And how we use energy, and how those how how energy flows. Um, so, given that um, it appears that I mean, for us to continue our technologically advanced lives, we need certain amounts of energy to sustain it. Um, and we've got more and more people that we're bringing out of poverty, and that are you know um, living uh, more uh, well, living better lives. So, our energy consumption. Um, is likely to increase. And it seems that progress itself is dependent upon the ability of a species to um, harness energy flows. So given that um, we are on this trajectory and we are faced with uh, the likes of, you know, we are faced with problems like climate change, uh, which are dependent upon our energy usage. Um, <clears throat> what would you say to policy makers or people um, when it comes to tackling um, this issue and how might we think about it from this, uh, this thermodynamic lens? The answer comes from uh, knowing, uh, knowing where, uh, where we came from to today for your ability to uh, look from so high up and ask these important questions. Uh, the answer is uh, obviously, uh, Greater movement requires uh, more fuel uh, and food consumed, but that's the uh, 
that's the the uh, the, the trivial uh, aspect of the answer the um, <clears throat> the subtle is that um, um, the um, what's been happening all along <clears throat> is um, is the uh, steady stream of innovations of uh, better contrivances or new techniques uh, for doing all these things that are responsible for uh, uh, the uh, design from uh, say uh, uh, fuel uh, somewhere in the ground to uh, power being used and uh, destroyed uh, into movement uh, all over the globe. Uh, so there is uh, uh, technology evolution that uh, or the freedom that uh, feeds that evolution of uh, um, first of all imagination and uh, education uh, and uh, the ability to question the status quo. Uh, so innovation, use that word, is is the uh, is the answer, frankly, to uh, to everything, and that includes uh, to the answer to these new questions that are appearing now on the uh, on the firmament, and they have to do with the fact that um, uh, our movement is no longer <laughs> ceased a long time to be uh, located uh, to the country that, uh, inside the country that you live. Um, the uh, movement now is global. In other words, uh, your, own, uh, your own presence on earth, uh, Sam, has uh, circled the globe. You know, you are uh, probably using a, a, a shirt made in Romania, I don't know where, but uh, you're definitely drinking tea out of uh, Sri Lanka, which is, uh, has nothing to do with uh, the spot that you occupied on the planet. Uh, I don't know what you drink, but uh, if I were you, I would be drinking, uh, 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 yeah, wine from Australia. So I'm uh, I'm global. Uh, the point the point I make is that uh, uh, human uh, flow, say air traffic, has uh, has hit the invisible wall, meaning that the global sphere is finite, and this uh, sort of uh, finiteness. Um, has the effect of, uh, of course, the, the movement is increasing uh, all the time, uh, has the effect of uh, making the layer of uh, this particular movement thicker and thicker. Or, but that means, yes, uh, air traffic on top of uh, railroad traffic and on top of uh, highway traffic and on top of everything else that moves on, on Earth. This uh, thickening of the uh, global flow um, it has uh, uh, two effects. One is the so-called uh, human geological age, which means the turning over of the uh, Earth's crust in a way that, uh, I don't know how far into the future, the next uh, uh, dominating species will wonder at the, how much we created and then buried. Uh, so that's one, uh, one, uh, uh, one, uh, direction in which to predict the future. But the other one is uh, the global warming, okay? Which has to do with uh, the fact that uh, there's only one sewer that uh, comprises both the sky and the oceans. And we have to uh, uh, come up with contrivances through innovation to, uh, to deal with, uh, that, uh, with that big uh, uh, invisible wall. Uh, invisible wall against which our movement is uh, is impinging, and uh, this is these are um, both of them are actually new questions that uh, come hand in glove with our success, and uh, once again uh, our success is uh, unstoppable because uh, uh, people are actually uh, like all animals not stupid, and um, and I think that uh, what's needed. What's needed is uh, is uh, not only uh, innovation, which means uh, change after change, and but uh, before that, what is needed is uh, for universities to uh, to uh, focus uh, uh, aggressively on uh, teaching the freedom to question, the freedom to question the uh, permanence of a technique, the uh, permanence of a habit, the uh, the obviously the importance of uh, uh, running away from the one size fits all uh, the uh, yes the uh, importance of uh, yeah questioning whether as i said the 
uh, one fuel is the answer to uh, everything in the future, or uh, one uh, uh, dumping ground is the answer to every uh, every uh, uh, source of waste. Uh, you see what I'm talking about? Uh, they, if you if you liberate the human mind, the uh, the stream of uh, of uh, ideas or you call them uh, inventions is uh, is uh, is unstoppable. Is unstoppable. Uh, we are. Uh, we uh, keep praise on uh, praise on the on the British. I think that's a very good uh, example once again. Um, in Britain, 200 years ago, in fact, in uh, in Western Europe, uh, with uh, Britain at, at the top of that particular heap, uh, the uh, the ability to question was uh, not only uh, uh, allowed. Uh, or uh, recognized, uh, it was actually rewarded. Rewarded. Uh, the, uh, I mean, look, uh, Lord Kelvin, okay? He was uh, knighted, whatever, because of his achievements in, uh, in, the, uh, in the business of uh, coming up with ideas. Uh, look, that's important, because uh, in other societies, uh, those uh, who raise their heads uh, above the crowd, uh, end up with their heads chopped off that's yeah. the, that's we have, the, a, uh, we have a problem like that in australia it's called um tall poppy syndrome so in australia like you know the tall poppy gets cut and there <laughs> seems to be this cultural thing here where if you you know, stick your neck out and you show that you're you know if you back yourself or if you think that you are good at something australians mm -hmm. have a they kind of cut you down a little bit they, you know, bring, <laughs> Australia is a very, uh, you know, there's not really a class. There aren't really classes. Everyone kind of sees each other as kind of equals, which, you know, in, in many ways we are, but at the expense of, I'd say people really going after things and um, really pursuing, like believing in themselves and going after things. And I think this is represented in our, I'd say lackluster innovation history. Um, well, well, well. Uh, but we, are, we, are, we don't need to get into that. I've just, it's just, because uh, I've only lived here for, you know, eight years and it's just been interesting. Maybe take, more than eight years. Take it from a person who's, uh, uh, who's, who's seen a lot more examples. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, no comparison example, to the... Examples could be much, much worse. Yeah, no comparison. No comparison. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I alluded to those very, very politely in uh, this particular book, uh, but um, the point of the book is physics, not uh, not politics. Uh, those of uh, uh, it's very important um, uh, to uh, to know the physics the way that you're uh, questioning here, uh, and then let uh, uh, clear-minded individuals uh, at whatever level of uh, power and um, action they happen to be positioned in society, let them uh, make uh, the best and the most educated decisions possible. Uh, there are only two uh, decisions, uh, what to do and what not to do. Uh, yeah. I, would start, I would start with what not to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a, that only a lot easier to, to answer, right? Because you can think about it from the, the freedom perspective, like you've got an infinite space in which you can act and knowing the right way to act is a lot harder than knowing which territory not to, to broach, right? Well, you, just, yeah, look, you cut uh, the territory so, uh, down. Right, but the way you speak is in fact uh, exactly the solution. You speak your own, your own way uh, now that you know the physics. I, uh, I may be speaking differently because I also know the physics. Um, um, I'm, uh, uh, gee, I'm not making any decisions except uh, about how to feed my family. That's, uh, but I also can decide uh, how I teach my students better tomorrow. And um, one decision I made uh, with words such as freedom and access and, um, and uh, yes, even evolution uh, uh, as a general term as opposed to some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, slang, slang term in a, a narrow Biology. field. Yeah, exactly. Uh, with these words, I'm trying to reach uh, reach 
people like uh, Adrian, uh, say, uh, 60 years ago when I was uh, growing up. I, uh, back then, I, I didn't know much, but I was uh, with uh, eyes and ears open. Uh, this is what's important. And by the way, once again, uh, the, uh, uh, okay, uh, listeners who, sorry, viewers who live in uh, places that are not as advanced as uh, uh, ours, uh, should ask themselves <laughs> why their places are not as advanced as ours, and then look at the uh, at the uh, at the difference in uh, in the way society is uh, is uh, uh, organized or designed. Uh, that's the. It's in other words, uh, even the act of looking requires freedom. Uh, freedom is. Uh, Let's call it a, uh, and now I'm going to contradict myself. Uh, one size fits all answer to everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who want to learn more about thermodynamics, um, where would you direct them? I know you've written a few textbooks as, as well. I, I wrote actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I think, I think I'm uh, proud to say I, I wrote, I wrote uh, several, yes, including the, uh, the, the most used text uh, at the graduate level in English uh, worldwide. It's called Advanced Engineering Thermodynamics uh, and uh, a few other such books, uh, Convection Heat Transfer, both are in the fourth edition. Um, the, uh, the way to begin though is for uh, those interested in thermodynamics to read the chapter one in the Freedom and Evolution. Uh, in uh, chapter one, I. Uh, Propose to myself to explain uh, thermodynamics in uh, about three drawings uh, with no equations and uh, with the uh, terminology that's accessible to uh, uh, young uh, boys and girls who graduate from high school, um, meaning to individuals who are um, open minded. Uh, these are not the ignorant individuals, but they're uh, unbiased. Uh, they are not indoctrinated, um, who are interested in uh, why the world around them is the way it is. And uh, the first answers come from uh, basically uh, that's the way nature is. And uh, nature is, uh, it's a short story called physics. Physics is really not a book full of formulas, uh, people. Physics, uh, uh, until recently, was not about formulas. It was about drawings of natural things. In fact, uh, now you bring up again, uh, sorry, I bring it up, uh, written uh, 200 years ago and earlier, were beautiful books full of uh, drawings of things. Uh, and yes, some of those drawings were showing uh, tendencies. Uh, tendencies, meaning the tendency to look the same. How is that? Uh, this is an old thing about nature from which uh, similarity in the geometry or similitude, uh, all these, these uh, observations of uh, nature called physics are, uh, are uh, in the language or languages that we all speak. Uh, so physics is not about mathematics. Physics should not be confused with mathematics. Mathematics is code, like the Morse code, is a way of uh, expressing, uh, telling a story in uh, fewer and fewer, with fewer and fewer characters and symbols. And in order for uh, the uh, receiver to get the message, the receiver has to be trained in that particular code. Well, uh, fine, fine. But before the code, uh, <laughs> we're born with the, uh, with uh, eyes and ears and brain. And uh, in, in this uh, combination, those three things, and touch and some other, and smell, in this combination, uh, we see uh, the world as images. We see images that are changing. Nature is uh, a movie, meaning every, everything about the surroundings that we perceive are movies, movies. It's not the formulas that uh, fly through the air or, uh, or uh, surprise you with sounds. 
in movies, the song itself is a is a changing thing. The sounds are telling you a story. Look, so um, by the way, I love mathematics. I'm good at it, but I'm not putting it down. I'm simply describing the uh, role that math uh, plays in uh, science and why math properly taught comes after uh, the teaching of uh, you know speaking and uh, writing and drawing at least it should come after these things and it should certainly come after the uh, teaching of uh, the importance of opening your eyes and by the way in these uh, in these uh, movies in the uh, in human perception the uh, the the thing that uh, in fact defines human perception is uh, is the uh, physical act of change. These images are changing. They're actually changing. <laughs> Why? Because they have freedom, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is it. Yeah. It's a very, very simple uh, uh, description of, uh, of reality. So just to summarize, um, would you say the constructor law is it's the physics of evolution. It is, meaning evolution is physics. Evolution is physics, and yeah. yeah. And, and uh, the principle that underpins this uh, natural tendency uh, is the constructor law. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm quite sure that others uh, have had this uh, idea. Maybe they s stated it uh, differently. Um, I, uh, I'm not aware, but uh, I think that uh, the way that I stated it is the most uh, encompassing, the most yep. uh, uh, in, uh, general, the one that brings together the uh, the so-called uh, uh, bio and the non-bio and also the social and all of these three things put together. Uh, I keep talking about movement on Earth, but it's a movement uh, uh, extraterrestrial. If uh, if you uh, think in that direction. Uh, or the movement of celestial bodies. I mean, yeah. uh, all these things that move <laughs> move because they are pushed, <laughs> and they are pushed by something that's burning somewhere. Um, um, I talk about, uh, for example, on Earth. I give uh, everything according to my drawings is uh, engines that uh, drive things that uh, rub against the uh, brakes. You know, you know, like mm -hmm. this brakes that uh, dissipate the power. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. So if uh, people want to find out uh, more about your work, if they want to you know, read your books or your papers or just f uh, follow you online, um, how can people um, get in touch or just come across your, to, to check out your work? Well, uh, I'll, I'll link all of it, by the way, in the show notes. So it'll all be there for people to, to see. Very good. Um, uh, I tell my students uh, that, um, um, people, uh, especially young people, uh, are of two kinds, uh, not the boys and girls. Uh, there are people who uh, answer their correspondence and people who don't. Uh, <laughs> I, and I'm one of those who answers uh, his correspondence. So to get in touch, you can uh, send me an email. Um, and or of course you can find me on LinkedIn. But uh, the best way is to uh, to uh, find my email address uh, by uh, googling, for example, my uh, office address at Duke University. Uh, I'm basically uh, public. There's no. I'm not uh, a uh, top level journalist uh, who is uh, hiding his uh, his uh, uh, email. Uh, uh, underground somewhere so that's the way o also to read my books you can uh, type my name on Amazon and then you'll see uh, uh, not only the multitude by the di but the diversity because this thing that we're discussing Sam is uh, 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 I wrote uh, recently three books uh, that are about uh, science for the public uh, most of my, my career has been about uh, science uh, for uh, students in the university, uh, also for my colleagues uh, about thermodynamics, heat transfer, uh, 
thermal design uh, power things like that uh, uh, only recently i decided to uh, to uh, uh, open myself to the general public and uh, i think i should have uh, opened myself uh, to the general public earlier in my career so well, uh, i'm have... glad you've done it <laughs> it's over the door for this conversation so uh, yeah thank you very yeah. much for that <laughs> So, uh, and what's interesting about people who uh, contact me, uh, just like you, uh, obviously, in this example, uh, these uh, human events lead to uh, um, satisfying conversations and new images in uh, the minds who are actually doing the, uh, the interaction. Um, and I benefit from this, you know. Because obviously, if I talk to my colleagues all the time, I, I, uh, I, uh, I tend to hear things that I know already. Okay. <laughs>